you need to look at your credit lending risk because when you're extending all the services, it's not free. You know, labor's not free. Time is not free. It's 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 an asset, mm. and when you give your time and service to other people, and you're not paid back, you're literally being defaulted on the payback of the loan. It's none other than Richard Solomon. Richard Solomon is a noted attorney and a business consultant. He's been out there for many decades. I'm not going to say how many because I don't want to give away his age. He's a young guy. You see, you see it on the face. He's been here on the show, and many of the listeners will recognize the name because he has a show on FM radio. So we're not head to head; we're buddies, and you know. But he's on the other side of radio. Tell us a little bit about your show, Richard, well, and then we'll get to your your practice. Thank you for the honor and privilege of being at, the, it's at this microphone. It's always fun getting together. Yes, absolutely. So I have a, I have a couple different shows, but primarily I, I have taking care of business, which is a radio show that's broadcast on eighty eight point one FM. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the Solomon Channel, that's really the showcase for all of my radio shows because I have a, a, an environmental show called Rocket Green Radio, and I'm associated with my father's place at the Roslyn Hotel in Roslyn, Long Island, right. which is the legendary, uh, you know, my father's place uh, music venue. And so my father's place radio is really broadcast out of there too. Nice. So all of those places all can be found at the SolomonChannel.com. S O L O M O. Solomon, yes. yes. And he is a bright guy, no pun intended, <laughs> going on the Solomon line here. Um, tonight's show, we're going to talk about three primary categories, and they're all so critical to any small to mid sized business. They're critical to large businesses as well, but we're going to talk about fines, tickets, and violations. Unfortunately, so many businesses are dealing with this on a, I don't want to say day in and day out basis, because if you're dealing with a day in and day out basis, I don't know how you're in business, <laughs> but a monthly basis or an, a quarterly basis, whatever the case is, Richard Solomon is a go-to attorney for this, uh, for this area. Again, you want to keep his number handy. You hope, you pray that you don't need to call him, but if you do need to call someone, it's him. We're going to get to his number in a minute. We're also going to talk about trade secrets, how to keep confidentiality to the best of your ability and how it interacts with your team, your employees. And we're also going to talk about cash flow dynamics. Now, since I teased the listeners about you and your practice, perhaps you could just describe your practice and give the contact information. I'm a small practice uh, attorney, and I, I tend to represent the mom and pop businesses out there. Uh, mom and pop businesses are, are really under a tremendous challenge these days. A lot of regulation. Um, there's a lot of competition. Mm -hmm. Everything's become really expensive. Everything's complicated. You need really good advisors. Everybody really needs a good accountant. They really do. In fact, I actually think that having a good accountant is more important than having a good lawyer. And by know. the way, <laughs> this just shows how what you know what an honest, straight up guy he is. <laughs> you know? And so I, I so I represent the smaller businesses, and they have a lot of challenges, and they need someone to guide them through the various things that we'll be talking about today because business has probably never been tougher to conduct than it is today and probably won't be any easier in the future. Oh, you're scaring us. <laughs> oh, but but so that, that creates opportunities. So, how do people get in touch with you? <laughs> oh, uh, the Solomon Channel is a great place to, to take a look at thesolomonchannel.com, but my office number is 516-371-4924 during business hours. And again, please uh, 516-371-4924. Okay, so which one should we open up? Should we talk about trade secrets and employees? Should we talk about cash flow dynamics or the violations and that whole? Let, let's talk about violations, fines, oh, summons, because that's, that's, a, that's a... Sticky stuff. You so, want to get so, it out of the way. So, so I, I remember okay. going to a, a restaurant and reading a, a fortune, and the fortune said, taxes are a punishment for doing something right. And fines are a punishment for doing something wrong. <laughs> so, a, you know, and, and yet, you know, when you read that in a fortune cookie, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yet, you know, in business, you really hit with both. Yeah. You know, you hit with taxes, high taxes, because there's all kinds of taxes, and that's a burden, a financial burden on a right. business. But then there's also between violations, uh, uh, f summonses that can result in fines, mm -hmm. and you know, tickets, all these other things. It's a real pressure on business, especially because fines generally are not deductible. If you think about, it, you know, tax, you know, tax-related items, mm -hmm. expenses, you know, all this equipment, all the rates is a write-off, but a fine just kind of disappears out there because it's not a deductible expense. Right. It's a punishment. So what you want to really do is try to keep 
all of your compliances out there to really reduce your risk of, of getting these kinds of mm-hmm. you know fines. Mm-hmm. The problem is if you have a truck, there are issues, all kinds of issues about how your trucks are supposed to be, the, the lettering on the sides, all, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, what kind of driver requirements you have, what kind of logs you're supposed to keep, uh, the, the state of the equipment. And at least in New York City, there's a whole enforcement group that just pull over the trucks. They weigh them, they look at them, they do a kind of inspection. Mm-hmm. The, the, on the state level, there's... Uh, the Department of Transportation, they do all these things too. And then even in, in the outer places and other parts, there's town and village courts and, you know, it, it, it's all this, all this compliance, a lot of regulation. And generally what happens is if, if you're not in regulation, you'll be issued a ticket. And the tickets can be very, very costly. So you have truck tickets. Mm-hmm. Uh, in New York City, there's Department of Transportation related tickets related to construction activity. There are Department of Buildings uh, violations now if you own a building, and I'm mm-hmm. sure there's a lot of people in your audience yes. that either run, you know, manage, or own real estate. Yes. They all know that the Department of Buildings does inspections, and there's all kinds of rules. You have to have uh, boilers have to be you know, registered, and you have to have all kinds of permits, and they, they check to make sure that after you've built something, you have a certificate of occupancy. Right, CFO. And, you know, you'd be surprised. And as lawyers, we come across situations where we see someone trying to sell a property without a certificate of occupancy or work was done without permits. Would a bank even process such a – I mean, would a, in the beginning, they, they – they, but at, at some point, can a person get a mortgage without a CFO? The answer is no, but not every property is either – Purchased with a mortgage or sold, right. you know. There's, right. you know, there's all what kinds. What do you mean of, they show up with a suitcase? <laughs> well, it's just that some people are self-finance, you know, <laughs> where they sold some other property. Now they're putting it into something else. Okay, you know, I, you know, I don't really do real estate. Actually, I don't do real estate at all. But okay, but you know, you hear, you know, when when lawyers get together, um, you always hear all the stories about oh. Um, you know that pool that so and so had in their house. Well, that was never like legitimized. <laughs> so now they have to either you know dig up the pool or now get the permits. With, and, you know whatever. You know <laughs> fill in with dirt, <laughs> sell the house, and then <laughs> you know all that other stuff. So there's there's tr- and, and you can end up in criminal court. Uh, some of the mm-hmm. things are actually criminal court. Uh, some of the the truck tickets and things like that are actually criminal court violations. If you're a corporation, you must have an attorney. Uh, represent you. You can't just show up on your own. Uh, there's also the the standard DMV tickets that everybody's familiar with, and of course, there's the red light cameras, the speed cameras. Right. I mean, there is no limit to the amount of ways in which regulatory authorities seek to make sure there's compliance, and without compliance, there are fines. And the the quote revenue that's generated from this is the billion billions of dollars. So yeah. now let's talk about a typical small business. It's on a main thoroughfare. Um, is it the fire department? What, what are the threats that are out there and what can they do to protect themselves? Well, the most important thing is to make sure that when you, first of all, you know, if, if you lease, make sure that your landlord goes, goes with you on all the things that are, you know, that is there a certificate of occupancy? Is everything up to code? Uh, if you have special equipment, do you have the permits for that equipment? Uh, you know, if you're like a restaurant, there's all kinds of certificates you're supposed to have as far as food handling and the fire suppression systems and the smoke uh, ventilators and things like that. Um, do you have all the safety equipment that you're required to have? Every industry generally has a lot of regulation. You know, even like if you cut hair, there's, you know, you have to have a hair cutting license. I mean, you know, it's, it's really, there's just a lot of things that require permits and licenses. If you're going to do any kind of construction, if you're going to, Going to have any vehicles? The vehicles have to be registered. They have to be registered to the business. the The side of the vehicle has to have the name of the owner. Sometimes you see a ticket called mixed um, registration, where mm-hmm. the, the the name on the side may have been something else, and then the registration something else. I, I just I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but you is very interesting question. Does a tenant? have to look after these things? Meaning it, it, it's the landlord's responsibility ultimately, but a tenant has to fight. Let's say a tenant's in a building and there's no CFO in the building. Well, you, you won't necessarily as the tenant get a, a, a fine for that. But for example, you will not get a liquor license if there's no certificate of occupancy mm. in your tenancy. So, you know, you really, everybody has to do their due diligence. And the problem is when you get the ticket, remember, it's in your name. <laughs> so you ultimately right. have to go to court and explain it. 
And a lot of times there's responsibility shifting and pointing. Well, you were supposed to do that. You know, it, there's leases that say, you know, we don't do anything. So if the roof needs to be replaced, now it's on you. But it's like, are you kidding? That's a capital item. Right. That's really should be, the, you know, the owner's responsibility. So good, good advisors. And, and advisors are really not just limited to lawyers. You need to have... You know, building inspectors. There are you know people who do for, as a living. Mm-hmm. They, they're they're building. They're engineers. They're right. arch, you know right. they have all these credentials. And they go and they say you know you need to have this. You need to have that. Um, there, there are different people who are experts in certain kinds of fields, mm-hmm. like fire safety, and you should have those people. You know, there's all kinds of re- regulations about sprinklers, right. and you have to make sure that you're in compliance. That uh, whatever things that you, you know, you you even see like in office buildings, you know, the elevator certificate where right. it says, you know, and elevators that's always in there. That, right, that's right. right there in the elevator. Right, it's, it says certificate on file that's in right. the super's office. That's right. So there's always something. So. Find the people. You see, a lot of businesses kind of just let things just run. Mm. But, you know, at, at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, are you in compliance? Who are the people who provide services? You know, if for certain businesses, you need to have pest control. You need to have whatever it is. Make sure that you're in compliance, that all your certificates and licenses are up to date, that, that everybody who drives your vehicles, that you actually make sure that their licenses are still valid, that they haven't been suspended. Uh, you know, a lot of times you see people with out-of-state driver's licenses, and all of a sudden they're not, not like an adjacent state, but like right. some way, you know, Alaska. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're, and they're always driving. And at some point, you know, you're supposed to change your address. According to the DMV, for example, you're supposed to change your address within 10 days of moving. Mm-hmm. Or something close to that. And you see a lot of that. Uh, the amount of tickets I, I've come across um, is, is staggering what you've seen. Everything from environmental violations where, you know, either you know, smoke, they don't have heavy diesel inspection stickers, uh, dripping oil. And these are major, major fines. Now, when you say major, I want to put it in context. What, 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 it, that's uh, well, it, $700, $1,000? It, it, it's, it's much more than businesses could afford because, you know, as, I want this to be a little it could be timeless. $5,000, $10,000? Well, dep- well, the thing is, sometimes you get pulled over. Mm-hmm. You don't get pulled, you get pulled over for one thing, mm-hmm. but when they start looking, all of a sudden mm-hmm. they start writing more and more tickets. And I've had cases with truck regulation fines, for example, where I've had as many as 15 tickets on one vehicle. Mm-hmm. They sit there and they start writing. Well, you didn't, your mud flap is cracked. Your directional signals aren't working. Your backup light isn't working. Your horn's not operative. You don't have a fire extinguisher. Um, you have an unsecured load. You have an uncovered load. Uh, you don't have what's called the, um, the US DOT number. Uh, you know, after so many pounds, you're supposed to have this. Right. The driver didn't have a daily log. You're supposed to have the driver supposed to go around the vehicle and look and make sure everything's in compliance, keep that. Uh, are, are you on the truck route? If you don't go, there's lots of truck routes out there. And trucks are supposed to stay on certain routes. And you're not supposed to be overweight. And there's certain things like you could be um, not overweight for the streets, but you could be overweight for a bridge. And then you get pulled over for that. So there's lots of lots of rules you have to have. If, you are, um, if you're a, a waste hauler, you need certain licenses from, like, say, New York City. Uh, in order to have that. And all those permits have to be up to date and everybody's licenses need to be up to date. Is there a certain time of year? I mean, you bring up a great point that every business should have some date or maybe twice a year where they say, you know what, I'm going to look at the law, look at the list and make sure that everything is in order. It should it be done, first of all, more than once a year and is there a certain date or is it just arbitrary? Well, the, the best practice is have all of your employees' licenses and credentials and everything on file. Mm-hmm. And then you should really have a calendar to make sure the people who are under your employee are, are in compliance if they're driving your vehicles, if they're doing deliveries. Got to make sure everybody, you know, where, where, you know. And there, there are companies out there that will, be, that will do compliance. And they'll, they'll double check. They'll, they'll train drivers. They'll train staff. They'll make sure they have the right, you know, in, in the transportation businesses medical certificates and logs. I mean, there's a, the, the problem is the amount of regulation out there is too numerous for anyone to really, really know. Uh, even as a business owner, the, the laws keep changing, the, the regulations is federal law, there's local law, you cross into another state and then you're subject to their law, state you know. Law. So, so the thing is find the experts. There, there's so many really good experts out there in all these fields, have them, but you should have a master calendar. What does your insurance do? 
you know, your insurance. Everybody has insurance. Right, right. When is it due? Uh, make sure two months beforehand you, that you reach out to your insurance broker right. <laughs> to make sure that the right. policy is coming. You can't always rely, on, rely on the mail coming right, in right. with the you notice. Know, especially now you, you go away for three days. Right. It got buried. The notice was in an email, <laughs> and it was under, you know. Right, 700 emails. Right. And, and the problem is there's so much clutter, yeah. digital clutter, that everything's coming in. It's coming in. It's easily lost. In fact, in many ways now, old-fashioned regular post office mail is more effective because at least it'll sit on your desk where something (laughs) else gets pushed all the way down to the bottom. (laughs) We're going to now move to trade secrets and employees. But before I do that, you know, I, as we have a you know great relationship, and I know you cannot share anything that's confidential. I mean, that's that's your line, but you always have great. We'll call them war stories. And the first segment of the show, which in case you missed it, folks, it will be up on MYB Radio by Tuesday morning. We talked about the importance of looking after all your documentation to make sure that you're not subject to any type of violation or, or, or to get hit with fines and tickets, etc. cetera. Um, you know, you know so there's an expression in the, in the marketing world is, you know, make them feel the pain. You know, I want people to realize that if something goes awry, it could really be problematic. Uh, do you have any good war stories to share? Well, the one thing I could say is this, and the, the, the parable behind the story is do your homework. Because, um, and then a, a very good friend of mine always says, um, pleading guilty is not always the best option. <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you a story. So, so I had a, a, a friend, and I, I don't really do traffic violations, but okay. once in a while there's an exception. Okay. And so the, the people were in the car, they were in New York, and the driver... The passenger has some very challenging health conditions. And the driver actually used the cell phone to make a call. And the police, of course, pulled them over. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a tough ticket because there's a, a, a number of different points, you know, you know, the DMV point system mm-hmm. in New York, associated with use of a cell phone. And it, financially, it's, it's also an impact, too. And if you have too many tickets altogether, there's a point system. If you hit too many points, you can be suspended. And then if you hit... So many points. Then they have this thing called the driver responsibility tax. So, wow. so right right now, at this at least showtime, if you have like more than so many points, like say I think it's I forgot what it is. I think it's six. Um, you have to pay an extra fine on top of it. Wow. So, but the, the, it keeps changing. So anyway, you always want to keep out of the court as much as possible. So they got a ticket for you know improper cell phone use. Mm-hmm. So. We went to court and I said, well, you know, the, 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 the reason why they were on the phone is they actually it was a medical emergency. The pastor was having a very, very bad medical episode and they were actually calling the actual surgeon and oncology right. people right. who were dealing with this very tragic situation. So when the police pulled them over, they, you know, they, the police said, well, you know, we can call 911 and, you know, and you'll, but 911 wouldn't have helped because this was right. Like, We're going to take them to a local hospital who is not familiar with the with the with the with the medical framework of right. that individual, right. this was, and it would just recomplicate the whole thing. Right, because what they do is the better option, at least for them, which is to call the cancer surgeons. Right. You know, at who the knew medic- that patient. Yes. And- and this was an on, you know, ongoing. Instead of shoving them yeah. into an ambulance and this and this. And of course, years. they got a ticket. So, uh, you know, so we go to court, and so I looked up the law, and I said, "Look, you know, did you realize there's an exception for calling police, fire, a, a doctor's office, you know, a hospital? There's all these exceptions." Mm-hmm. So I brought it to the court's attention. I said, "You know, there is an exception. It's not just the 911 exception. The exception is if you're calling." A, you know, these are all the exceptions, right, and and right. if the call is being made in that pursuit, so even the the court, you know, we brought the medical file, we okay. brought the actual pharmaceutical product that was an issue, and we said, look, you know, that the, we were calling the specific. Like, this is all part of the exceptions to the rule, right. and the court actually realized that we were correct and and dismissed the ticket. Mm-hmm. So you do need to do your homework, right. Right. Um, and yeah, and yes, you know, dealing with tickets is is is. A burden. It's a time burden. Even when you win, it's a time burden. You right. Know? Time. But but you you you, you, you kind of have to see where your moves are because it's important to to fight where you can. And sometimes you do have rights that should be enforced. So we're going to move along right. to trade secrets and employees. 
Um, that's a wide open area because that could include, you know, NDAs, enforcing documents, what happens if you have people on your team and they move somewhere else, uh, but yet at the same time they're carrying secrets, confidential secrets within the company. Um, at, that's just a, such a wide open area. Richard, how do you advise well, on that? Trade secrets is a tricky process because trade secrets encompass everything from how you actually do things. Mm -hmm. How do you manufacture something? Sequencing, delivery, uh, shopping, getting good prices. You know, when you think right. about it, like just even how like you do your radio show is a trade secret. How do you get your guests? How do you format the show? How do you get the sponsors? How do you right. get um, the social media out there to support the show? That's all your trade secret. It's all formulas. You know, everybody thinks of trade secrets as the secret recipe for the soda right. in the vault in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> Only two people know it, and you need, you know, and I guess you need two people to turn the key at the same time, you know, seven feet apart. But but there are so many trade secrets now. You can't protect all of them. Right. And there's a lot of information on the internet now anyway. Right. But what you really want to do is, to the extent I've always been a believer that to keep trade secrets secret. You just don't memorialize everything, um, and you don't really spread it. You know, you don't need to. It's it's almost like a need to know. If 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 everybody in the organization doesn't need to know something that's somewhat proprietary, your supply chain, your this, your that, how you get good credit, how do you do this versus your competitors, just keep it closer right. to the core group of people that that really need to know it. Right. The second thing is. To the extent that you have certain information, you should have employee handbooks that specify what people's obligations are. You should really mark certain things confidential. Uh, <clears throat> nobody really thinks about that, but if something is really confidential to a business, you should either have a rubber stamp or something at the bottom that says this is a confidential document and it's the property, the, the intellectual property of, M, you know, mind your right. business right. radio. Right. Uh, because this way, if it gets copied and it's out there, at least, you know, there's a way of saying, look, you know, that was an improper copy. Right. Certain businesses have documents, have certain kinds of stripes that this says do not copy. The, the, the more, more important thing is don't generate it. If you don't generate it, it's not a problem. A lot of times there's issues with NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, and this and that. And a lot of times I say, why don't you just tell me what you can tell me from public domain information? Let's What's out there? Because I think there's so much of a quest by so many people to be overprotective that they overreach on like, hey, well, everything is confidential. Everything's not confidential. You know, if you're, if you're building a building, the architectural plans are what they are. Uh, everything's publicly filed. Uh, you need to have permits. You know, who the contractors and building people are, it's all public record. So mm -hmm. even though you think it's sort of proprietary, mm -hmm. some of it is really not as proprietary as you think. So let's talk about what the world knows because nothing, you know, trade secret really means a secret. Whereas if something is you just don't want it to be widespread, then you say you could have agreements. Look, we won't post it on the internet. We won't put pictures of the project right. out there. Right. But, you know, that doesn't prevent a lot of other things from happening anyway. Um, NDAs are, are, are more of a thing of comfort. Okay. You still have to, if, if they're violated, you have to enforce them. you got to go to court. You have to get an injunction. Maybe that's a bond has to be posted. So what I always say is keep the secret secret. Try to deal with mostly public information. And then really just deal with people you trust and respect because trust and respect is more powerful than the best agreement. I, I remember I had a client who said, I don't trust this guy. That was the first, the, the first phrase. I don't <laughs> trust this guy, but I want the best agreement, you know, ironclad. And, and I said to this particular Hello. gentleman, I said, the fact that you said, I don't trust this guy, that's the operative part right. because agreements are more like mechanics Mechanical items where it, they're, they, it just shows you how things work, how things are supposed to be done. But if people are going to break an agreement, right. breach the agreement, you know, the more proper legal term, it doesn't matter what the agreement says because you have to go to court, spend money, the war of attrition, and um, yeah. you know, right. prevention. Right. Prevent. Let me tell you, the, the, the best legal advice I could give to all the people out there is prevention is better than lawyering. All right. It, it, when it comes to when it, when it comes through our doors as lawyers, the carnage has already happened. Now it's <laughs> you know <laughs> finger pointing and and responsibility shifting and blame. It's better if our offices were quiet 
and we help people prevent things. It's like medicine. Right. The best medicine is preventing things as opposed to curing. Now, obviously, when there's a, a terrible disease or even a it little bit, to be you want to right. cure it. Right. But prevention is so much better. It's just so much better on economically, emotionally. And the more businesses can prevent things by reducing risk and ensuring compliance and being more careful. You know. My guess is the noted <laughs> attorney, Richard Solomon. Um, how could people get in touch with you? Uh, the SolomonChannel.com is great. 346Broadway.com is and another. Again, 346Broadway.com is specifically for, for truck regulation truck funds. Regulations. And right. I actually have a lot of information on there about where the different criminal courts are for the truck fines in New York City. Uh, my practice is only limited to New York, you know, New York State. And okay. I don't really practice upstate or anything like that. I'm Got really it. down here. I'm a local Got boy. <laughs> Got it. And what's the phone number? 516-371-4924. Cash flow dynamics. Now, you might be wondering, what does an attorney have to do with that? And the answer is, he's also a noted business consultant. Richard is a noted business consultant. I know. And I, by the way, I've drank the Kool-Aid. I work with Richard. And I found him to be um, extremely knowledgeable. Is, is, is very nice. Is, is a nice accolade. But um, strategic. I think that's the word I, I love to use here. Because... He's not only a, a an attorney that just grinds his way through and you know and, and tries to come to a solution that way, but is very strategic about how he goes about it. I mean, there was a certain case, obviously we're not gonna go into specifics in public, but there was a specific case he was working on for our company. And because he was so strategic, we settled in a very, very positive way. And and thank you for that case, Richard. Well, thank you. Um, and it was because I remember the ins and outs that you didn't just grind your way and, and, and hammer the other side. You were like, you you came up with the right strategy in order to in order to deal with it. Let, let's leave it at that. It's yeah. chess moves. As yeah, it was chess to, moves. Right. It's it's chess moves, not sledgehammer. <laughs> That's exactly right. Right. Chess. So let's talk about cash flow dynamics. And by the way, feel free to share any great stories on that. All right. Well, the first thing is in understanding. And it's not a very well-known understanding. But when, let's. I'm going to give you mm -hmm. service, okay? okay? So when I'm lending you the service, mm -hmm. I'm actually really lending you money, all right? Because, right, because I'm paying my people. Right. So, for, okay. Right. So, so well, let's you're say- you're paying yourself. Right, let's go- let, you you know you, I, you you're going to do marketing right right all right so you're going to do marketing and then send me a bill mm -hmm. right so in a sense you've lent me the dollar value of that marketing service for that time mm -hmm. so in a, in a way there's almost like a financing going on so right. you're hoping that the the the, le the loan's going to be repaid so people don't understand that when you are extending credit to people 30 days, 60 days, whatever it is, whether, whatever, whatever you're doing, and you send a bill, accounting services, engineering services, uh, legal service, whatever it is, and you send the bill, you've actually already really lent the money, and now you're trying to get the loan repaid. That's right. right? Because Many people don't look at it that way. Right. At many, most. Right. <laughs> so, so what I always say, and I'm, I'm probably one of the few that kind of say this, you need to look at your credit lending risk. Because when you're extending all the services, it's not free. You know, labor's not free. Time is not free. It's, 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 it's an asset. Mm. And when you give your time and service to other people and you're not paid back, you're literally being defaulted on the payback of the loan. And that's a problem. And that's where businesses get into trouble because they weren't tight enough. You can't be too tight because then you have no business. Right. But you have to find the right level of risk because there's always risk there will be clients who have unfortunate circumstances there could be health issues they can unfortunately pass away they can they, they can be bought out all, oh, there's all these things that can happen but it's your risk what is your risk how much do you want to cap you know maybe you only want to give me x dollars of marketing service before the I mean, 30 days the are up Let's right say they, they whatever twenty five hundred dollars five thousand dollars whatever it is but then right. once they hit the ceiling Basically, that's it. I, that's it. It's like, hey, Rich, you got right. You got to pay. <laughs> right, right, right. right or, 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 you know, our right. Michal and the other people are going to slash right. your tires. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> <But> <laughs> they just let the air out slowly. <laughs> no, 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 no. We don't do that. Either. Just kidding. But, but you have to do that. Um, you have to now. One guideline mm -hmm. is perhaps to lend money, so to speak, below the limit of small claims court. 
because small claims court is a mechanism for you to represent yourself without an attorney in most places. And depending on the jurisdiction, it, it, it could be as much as $5,000. It's In some places, it could be more, and in some places, it's less, depending on where it is. But right now, at New York City level, small claims court is $5,000. And that's true of like Nassau County and some of the surrounding counties, mm-hmm. too. So let's say we do marketing services for 4500 bucks. Mm-hmm. I don't pay. Well, instead of hiring a lawyer to sue me and this and that, you go to you fill out the form. It's like you know thirty dollars more or less mm-hmm. uh, to, to show you like the relative value because it changes it a little bit and there's postage that the court uh, puts on it. But for thirty dollars, you could sue. For the forty five hundred, you don't have to get a lawyer. You don't have to. It's, it, there's no real discovery, which is the exchange of information and all this other complexity. You go to small claims court. So a lot of times, what I tell people is limit your credit lending risk to $5,000 and then only limit it to a number of different clients who you're willing to risk. And then this way you can control your collections. You don't need to have collection agencies, outside lawyers, because all those people are more taxes. Because what does the collection agency do? They collect money, but then they take a piece of it. Same thing with attorneys. You know, they either charge an hourly or a contingency fee. And it's like, let's put it this way, on the $4,500, you get a lawyer, and they charge so much money, or they take a third, or whatever. Right, right. But and, then, then, and then they have to settle, right? Because so you're, you're not going to pay forty five hundred. Right? So, you know, we'll, you, settle, we'll settle for twenty two fifty. Right, right. And, and then, then the lawyer the gets eight hundred. Now all of a sudden, then, what do you have? Right. You have thirteen hundred yeah, bucks. That's and what good is so? So what happens is people are very bitter because it's like, wait, I was owed forty five hundred, right. and I'm walking out with thirteen hundred. I got stiffed, and it's like that's the problem. So you right. need to. Reduce your risk. Right. Now, while we're talking about cash flow, mm-hmm. there's obviously small claims. Um, one of the issues that that I always see is how do you determine for cash flow purposes of your business how to price your items? You know, a lot of times, like, what do you charge? Well, the guy down the street's charging, you know, twenty dollars for the piece of luggage, but. Well, you don't know what their rent is, and you don't know what their insurance is. You don't know what their overhead is. So maybe twenty dollars is a good price. Given there, but maybe your rent is higher, so or or you have other circumstances. Okay, but the but the but in that particular case, you know, doesn't the proprietor have to be competitive in the market? Because even though his expenses are more, if he's going to charge twenty two dollars for the same item, then no one's going to buy by him. But maybe then you don't sell that item. Then you get become okay. more niche right. okay. and you sell other things. But one of the things is professionals. Mm -hmm. What is your hourly rate? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people just kind of come up with a number. But you need to almost work backwards, which is, what does it cost to run your operation? Overhead insurance, uh, the the phone, the answering systems, uh, whatever it is, the utilities. And then how many hours do you work a year? And then you should figure out what that hourly rate is. Now, if it turns out and you price out all your costs and your hourly rate is 255. Right. And you're billing at one ninety five, you're losing thirty dollars an hour. Right. So you don't want to do that. That means you have to work more than the hours that you've anticipated right. to make up for that differential. So you really should sit down with a financial person like an accountant and figure out what you should be charging, what your cash flow should be, what your revenue should be, and sort of use that as a guidepost because a lot of people are very loose about how they determine, well, uh, they, well what, what does a lawyer charge? Ah, you know, $100 right. an hour. So there you go. I'll charge $100 <laughs> an hour. And then you hear these right. crazy stories, well, the guy, guy charges, you know, $2,000 an hour. But maybe they charge $2,000 an hour because they do biomedical pharmacy, you know, right. applications, right. Highly... which is, you know, really technical. Right. And the, the person who's doing it is both a a lawyer, an engineer, and a pharmacist, and right. it's very specialized. Right. So there, that's a good bargain. But if it's just, you know, someone just review an agreement, well, that's not really, you know. So you have to find your spots, you know, where your niches are. Um, as far as, if I could talk a little bit about, sure. uh, you know, uh, wages, you know, there are a lot of new wage laws. Mm-hmm. Uh, make sure that you're always in compliance with the Fair Labor Standards Act. The federal, you know, there's federal laws about how you pay your employees, timekeeping, Overtime, uh, there's something called spread of hours that a lot of people don't seem to know about. But if you work so many hours, then you get an extra hour of free pay to cover that time. Um, a lot of lawyer, a lot of lawyers don't really know this kind of law. 
uh, because it's not something that's in what they do. If, you know, if they do real estate or do this and that, may not be. It's more of an employment slash labor uh, penumbra. Uh, you know, so what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're in compliance. Maybe the accountants kind of know that because they deal with payroll. Right. If you have a payroll company, mm -hmm. those are great places to get some information. Um, in fact, not only would you get sort of like the wage and hour information, but things like one of the problems in the workplace that affects cash flow is sexual harassment. You have to have training for sexual harassment. It's, uh, there are new laws about that. There's, there's all kinds of compliance. Um, and the payroll companies actually have programs, and, 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 and some of the insurance companies too, uh, if you buy sexual harassment insurance, they'll, they'll help you to reduce your risk, be in mm. compliance. Right. So go use the re – a lot of people have resources that are available to them. And they don't even know that they have them. You know, it's like, you know, you get all these like credit cards. But if you do this, you get this. You know, there's right. all these member right. benefits, but right. nobody knows about it. And, well, you know, it's like when you get a car, there's roadside assistance, but right. nobody uses them. Look to see. There's actually things that are probably that you're already paying for that you could take advantage of. You know. Richard, we're closing in on the final, basically five minutes left to the show. Um, one of the areas that we did not discuss yet is... Uh, I don't want to say a favorite area of yours, but an area that you handle so well, and that is collections. Um, perhaps you could even share a uh, maybe a war story about that oh. and some tips for the listeners on Th that. There's a lot of stories with re regard to collection. I think the most important thing that people have to keep in mind is you need to deal with the collection process at the contract stage, mm. at the beginning of the relationship stage, more so than at the last at the part, at when, the like denouement. Said, like like yeah. where the carnage has already happened. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, good example is, I'm Rich Sal. Hey, how you doing? Blah, blah, right. blah. What's the name of your company? Yeah, yeah, Rich Sal. Yeah, 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 okay. whatever. And uh, turns out that's not the name of the company. Mm -hmm. The name of the company is something like Worldwide Marketing Enterprises of, you know, uh, of, uh, of United you, States, you know, of, of Orange County and, oh, and other places, dot com Inc., you know. <laughs> and so, so you go to court. And you know you sue whatever it is, and then you try to collect the judgment, and of course there's no no bank account, there's this no that, and it's like what happened? It's like well you spent all this time chasing the wind because the information that you had wasn't precise, and you need to know who are you dealing with, who what you know who who are the people, who's the company, where are they located, are there multiple addresses, are they in different states? You know, sometimes you're dealing with people in different states. You have to sue them in that state sometimes as opposed to here because default judgments are not necessarily honored. There's a lot of rules that I don't want to burn right. everybody with. Right. But but it's really important. Who are you dealing with? And what are your mechanisms to make sure that you will collect? Limit your, you know, risk. Try to get credit cards to the extent that you can. Try Try not to deal with people that you don't really know. Uh, it's hard when you deal with you know the general public out there. Sometimes things come in as an emergency. I need this right away. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, 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 money. Uh, <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, you just see sort of the vapors of the jet stream coming at you. You know, <laughs> or you know, is that dust in my face? <laughs> oy, oy. I think that's sand. You know. <laughs> you know. So who are you dealing with is a critical question. Get you know, business cards are not legal documents. You know, websites are not necessarily a corporate address. And a lot of people sometimes really work out of, uh, you know, those virtual offices. Right. They don't really have a real space. They're using a cell phone. They're kind of just, you know. Floating. Yeah, you know, they, they, they say they're running the business out of their shirt pocket. Right. You know, they got the phone. They got their, you know, their little email stuff set up. Right. But, but if you need to collect money, where's that money coming from? You want maybe, to, so, you know, and people feel, oh, it's intrusive to find out, you know, the right, address and not, the references. But, and what but Richard you, is making it very clear. Yeah. You need to have that information. Don't just rely yeah. on goodwill and friendliness and all that. You and gotta, representations. Yeah. It's not, you know, and sometimes people are not necessarily disingenuous with the information, but they're a little like, oh, yeah, everybody knows me as, you know, Rich the lawyer, you know, mm -hmm. but that's not the name of the business or Rich the radio guy, you know, it's that's not, you know, that's not the, how it works. Richard, we have roughly a minute left. 
First of all, how can people get in touch with you? All right, the SolomonChannel.com. I also have a lot of great stuff up on YouTube. I have a number of different shows up on YouTube. Richard A. Solomon? Richard A. Solomon. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, the SolomonChannel.com. And you can, we have all kinds of great shows on many non-legal topics. We even cover Fleet Week and, and rock stars and great stuff. And then stuff. what's the Broadway.com? What's oh, 346Broadway.com is okay. the truck corporate truck regulation okay. uh, uh, website. Which and is, again, the phone number, they can get in touch? 516 371 one four nine two four what's a quick takeaway quick takeaway is do your homework uh, don't be shy uh, ask questions and don't take things for granted i love the honor of interviewing c-level executives and sharing their great advice and perspective on mind your business i'd love to get your feedback post it in the comments below and subscribe you'll never miss an edition of mind your business 